Hello. It's a great privilege to be part of this global conversation and a considerable honour. Shortly before he passed away, Sir Ken Robinson called Andrew Park, founder of We Are Cognitive, to arrange a gift for his beloved community. A new animation, based on what proved to be his last public talk, My Thoughts for the Call to Unite. The team at We Are Cognitive, whose RSA animates have created joy, sparked wonder, and have engaged the minds of over 100 million people globally, have worked tirelessly for months to ensure that you receive the gift Sir Ken wanted you to have. Sir Ken's team, Anthony Dunn and Kate Robinson, founders of Imagine If, are joined by Andrew and Dan to talk us through the story behind the animation, a future for us all. I'm Andrew Park, I'm the founder of uh, We Are Cognitive, and I am also uh, still very active in drawing a lot of the films that we make and um, designing uh, these sort of visual pieces. I really enjoy it. I keep my hand in what I love to do. And hi, my name's Dan. I'm uh, managing senior creative at uh, We Are Cognitive. Um, I've been working with Andrew for about 10 years now, um, started as an animator uh, and uh, just, yeah, um, do a lot of visual thinking, a uh, bit of drawing, a uh, bit of directing the films and um, yeah, been collaborating on this piece. Fantastic. And so you are obviously the animators behind Dad's RSA animate film, Changing Education Paradigms, which is just, I mean, it's been seen by literally millions of people around the world. And we're lucky enough to hear about what it's meant to so many people. But can you tell us a bit about how that came about, the inspiration behind the project, and maybe a little bit of the process of making it? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, it, was, it was a while ago now. I think it's been... It was. <laughs> a more, is it a decade ago, possibly? I'm longer than that. It, Closer to 15 years, I think. It, it is a long time ago, and um, but it, it still feels uh, one of those. It, it's actually probably the piece of work that we did for the RSA, which was the sort of transition piece. I think the, the piece that really broke out and kind of called, caused a, a bit of a zeitgeist with A, the medium that we invented, which was sort of whiteboard animation. Which has been copied, well, in, has inspired, <laughs> inspired several other you, yeah. similar type <laughs> types of videos. I mean, it's really taken off as a medium. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things that I, I have talked about this before, um, that obviously drawing on a whiteboard, we didn't invent that. Right. Um, it's been around for a while, you know. It's a thing. <laughs> for a, a long time, blackboards, whiteboards. I, well, actually, I always say this and... Uh, I always talk about cave painting as, as one of the earliest forms yeah. of, you know, you're drawing on a surface to um, inform a group of people. I mean, it's a natural progression for something like that, isn't it? Um, so we didn't invent drawing on whiteboards or drawing on surfaces quite a long time ago, 30,000 years in, in, uh, <laughs> in the making. But what kind of happened with it was um, obviously technology taking place at the time. You've got things like YouTube were coming on really on stream with the, the sort of bandwidth that you could have um, videos were actually useful on the internet. You could actually watch them without, you know, buffering all the time. It was, it was, uh, the technology had improved. Um, the, obviously things like, you know, your dad's talk at the RSA, fantastic content. And, you know, the delivery was just brilliant. And so working with audio like that was easy. You know, it's a great talk as a piece of audio. So putting visuals to that was easy. So we've got three things going on. You've got a, uh, a whiteboard a platform animation. You've got brilliant content speakers, and then you've got a delivery mechanism platform, YouTube. So these things sort of came together and made it kind of a, a viral uh, me media. That's yeah. how it kind of coalesced, I suppose, into that uh, easily accessible, digestible format. And uh, yeah, people jumped on board that. It's, it's weird that you think that, why hasn't this happened? Why didn't this happen before? Uh, but it was just kind of, we got lucky, I suppose. Lucky is one word for it. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, I remember somebody um, at an event once, that a question was asked of somebody and they said, do you ever wake up and think I'm so lucky? 
And the person responded and said, no, I wake up every day and think, wow, I worked really hard for this. <laughs> um, so I'd say luck is maybe a tiny element in it, but you're right. It was kind of all, all the foundations for a viral opportunity, wasn't it? Well, I'm in it for the hand, if I'm honest, Andrew. Um, that's your hand, isn't it? Is it your hand? It is my hand. Yeah, I mean, the, that's amazing. The, going back to those um, earlier films, you know, a lot of people wrote to us at the time and said, how, what software do you use? And I said, like, what do you mean? It's like the whiteboard. <laughs> software, the technology is old school. It's like pens and the whiteboard. But incredibly advanced. <laughs> Maybe they were talking about the state of your hands. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Do you, did you, you wouldn't be, um, this is where the sort of hairy hand thing came from, was that I remember reading some comments once on YouTube. I don't even know if it was on your dad's film, but it was like someone had written, ooh, this guy's got really hairy hands or something. <laughs> I was just like, what? No. And so, but it became a bit of a joke. The, the, uh, the, the people at the RSA were like, It's oh, amazing you watching hand. you do it. Isn't it? It's amazing watching you do that. That's what I, I love the most, is that knowing that now in particular, and I, I suppose, I hope that, I mean, that's educated someone watching this will go, oh my word, that's not stop animation in any way that it's a contrived hand. That's literally you drawing that out for that piece. How long did that take? Now, you gotta, I've got to think back 10 years or more. Sorry. Um, interesting. I'm, I'm, hopefully we can cut in some pictures of, uh, uh, of the, I think I've got the original drawings in my sketchbook of when I mapped it out. They're like really rough thumbnails of how it sort of came about. So I used to just really scrappily draw them and then it'd be like, right, camera over the shoulder, <laughs> When we, we, do you remember, Dan, we, um, we had the studio down, down the road there. And um, because I didn't know any of this was going to be successful or work, we went, right, what lights do we need? And it was in the days before LED lighting. And we had these, I thought, right, we'll go to B&Q and we'll have, the, uh, we'll have these <laughs> like, garden lights, you know, those tungsten things. And we wired them up on the ceiling, just about 10 of them. Oh, God, it was hot in there. You know, I was just like... Firstly, I had to draw, so the camera's over my shoulder and I had to draw at a right angle like that. So, you know, I wasn't actually like drawing like that. My hand was here. So I'm drawing at an angle. Things that, it, it was a real performance. You, it's quite, yeah. you, you're sort of doing things not naturally. So I don't know how many RSA films are actually made. I think it's 21 in all. The last and few, Last couple, I think, were digital, but most of them were at whiteboard. Did you end up with just one very big arm muscle as a result? No, I got a very big lump in my shoulder, Kate. Oh, no. So I was That's like, I'm still there. Is I've it? I've been to like Chinese medicine, I've had acupuncture on it and everything. So I've got like a occupational health lump in my shoulder from drawing weird oh, no. at an angle. So thankfully, when we got the digital stuff come online, it's just a lot easier. Well, I tell you what, the lump was worth it. Can we, we've done a bit of a campaign and we've asked people to send in what the talk has meant to them because as I said, we, we get this feedback quite a lot and obviously Dad's TED Talk was very successful, but I'd say out of, you know, I'd say a third of the people who come to us oh, every time, I cannot get these numbers right, maybe just less than 50% of people come to us and say that the RSA animate is the talk that resonated most with them about it because, you know, people, a lot of people who are inspired by dad and the work that he did and the, you know who sort of his message resonate with a neurodivergent and so for them to be able to see an image appearing whilst they're listening to something it, it, you know it it really mattered to a lot of people so we've got we've got a little excerpt of something of somebody so can we play it your fingers crossed this work <laughs> i wanted to share how the rsa animate video for changing education paradigms has completely shaped my life, I have to say, as a teacher. Um, I was actually given Sir Ken's book out of our minds when I was a senior in college because a professor saw something in me that um, just reminded her of Sir Ken and his work. Um, it was so dense to read at that age, but I was really committed to it. And um, then when I found his TED Talk and I found the RSA Animate, uh, things really changed for me. I started showing it to students, and at the time I was a middle school student, or teacher, sorry, 
And um, actually, I got called subversive um, because I hosted what I called TED Lunch, where we would watch TED Talks and talk about them, and that was the first one I showed. And then when that happened, I didn't really even know what the word subversive was saying, um, but I embraced it. And instead of, you know, crawling back into my shell of safety and doing things the way everyone else is doing it, I moved forward with the uh, idea that we needed to wake our kids up. We needed to stop anesthetizing them and we needed to start creating aesthetic experiences. And um, for 13 years as a dance teacher, that's what I did. I'm so proud of it. I'm gonna get emotional talking about. And now I founded a nonprofit um, to support teachers. And I get to do this work on a larger level to empower more teachers to teach this way. And I will forever be grateful for the work of Sir Ken Robinson and for that RSA Animate, which so many of my students, probably at this point, 3,000 students have seen over the course of my 13 year uh, classroom teaching. So thank you, please keep it up. Um, please keep putting work out there and um, I love I would love to be part of this community so proud thank you I know there's Amanda Cook well wow, that's that, that that's phenomenal because um, you know the, the ratio we have with the RSA is that we were, were brought in to do these films and often they receive the feedback and we we don't you know sometimes so it's really lovely to actually hear that from someone that it's affected personally. Um, that makes makes you feel really proud about being involved in. It's sort. something that really, um, at the time when it came out, a lot of my peers were uh, going into sort of teacher training and things. And it was one of those things that started, you just saw it everywhere. And you saw it appearing, you know, people would post it on, you know, my Facebook page. And I remember saying, well, this is somebody, this is, this is a company I'm actually applying for a job with. I'm really kind of excited by. Um, and, you know, even sort of uh, early, sort of late 2019, early 2020, I was going to look around schools for my son, uh, you know, and, and looking around and being invited into the deputy head's office. It was there printed out on the wall. They had a lovely print of it. So it's sort of, you know, obviously resonated yeah. and, and resonated across sort of time. It's not just been something that, you know, had its moment and then passed. It, it's, uh, you know, even from the work we do, at we are cognitive. It, it gets brought up you know sort of for a large proportion of the, the calls that come in so um it's it's got that kind of longevity as well yeah oh, it really does and it's important to say as well it's been seen about i think it's what 17 million times um online but as that woman said she's shown it to so many students so when you factor in how many and we get people telling us all the time they've played it at conferences they've played it to their teachers they've played it to their students you know it's been seen countless more times than even the numbers online indicate it's just i mean it really does it really does resonate with people. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, speaking from my perspective, I I consume visually a lot more than I'd say, I suppose most. I don't want to kind of suppose too much. But what I love there on Amanda's feedback is the, the transversion of the density that she talked about of, of Ken's work. I mean, your dad was so inspirational that he would take the most complex concepts and make them seem so simplistic and understandable and digestible what's really lovely here is the transference between that and then how you then apply in your work process Andrew and Dan is how do you deal with that density like where do you start where did you start not at the beginning usually it's just <laughs> very good wherever it takes your fancy you sort of um I, I think particularly on, on a really big epic dense piece you've got to kind of find a way in um and if there's if there's a kind of huge concept underpinning something that may not be described linearly in the course of, you know, a, a talk or a, or a piece. And actually, you sort of have to dart around conceptually and slowly piece it together in a, um, mm -hmm. uh, in that almost like a kind of jigsaw puzzle, like just shuffling ideas around till they start to fit. It's yeah. infuriating for the animators, but um, <laughs> if there's a degree of spontaneity and non-linear thought in the uh, uh, animation process and illustration process, which is, could be really exciting. Yeah, that's interesting because I... There's never, you're right, Dan, there's never a, a linear, like, we'll start at the beginning and then we'll end at the end because the end is often not in sight yet with these things. 
Yeah. Um, and that's because I, I like to view these things as a, a sort of living documents. You know, they're, they're temporal based. You're, you're working on them. You have experiences while you're working on them. They take a while to produce while you're doing them, especially uh, now we've got sort of more um, digital and we can sort of really, really delve down into some complex um, visualizations. With the early one on the, on the whiteboard, obviously, I, I just watched it about 10 minutes before we, we got on the call just to refresh myself. And I, I, I was even watching that going, actually, this is, this is quite, quite densely packed. And you're right, yeah. it's densely packed, but there's a lot of layers in there at different levels. So people, I think what you're trying to get at is that people can enter in at certain levels and, and one picture might resonate with them or one piece of audio, one piece of, you know, they're, they're, they're multi-faceted. Uh, so that gives people a lot of entry points mm. uh, to, to, they might, as you, Anthony, your, your visual, you might come at it from a visual point of view, but someone might hear that piece of audio or might see that bit of text being written. So that's what we're trying to do with the media in the first place is make um, make it uh, a multi-learning experience. So, you know, you don't have to have one learning style, you know. I, I, I like to believe that these, uh, you know, the Howard Gardner multiple intelligence thing works on one level, which is, I don't think that everyone's got a preference for like one thing or another. I think we've got a combination of all of those things going on at once. And I think that's why these, these whiteboard animations work because they, they, they're like the brain, they're complex, you know, they, they, yeah. they like the way you think. They unpack information in that kind of organic way. Rather it's than... linked as well, really, isn't it? You know, talking about synapses where sometimes, you know, you kind of run away with an idea. It's just sort of one thing literally knocks into another and that sparks something um, that you don't always know where that's going to go, where it's going to end up. And uh, it's, um, yeah, I think it is quite a unique kind of process in that, in that sense. I, th I think because I was trained as a fine artist, I think as an artist, um, you spend a lot of your personal, um, personal work time developing strategies for creating uh, confections that are going to be interesting, you know. And so anything like this, where, as I said, it's temporal based, you've, you've got time to sort of think of an idea, get response from that, that um, network of ideas banging up against each other. And then you've got time to sort of seed stuff in that might not be um, immediately like recognizable. Oh, wow, that's on the nose, bang that idea is there it just be like subtly underneath just doing another thing so you can have the audio say one thing but your picture say something slightly off or different which then creates that um i think that creates something different in the brain that says oh i must pay attention to that because that's not quite landing right it's odd and that that oddness creates kind of interest and that interest makes it memorable does that make sense no, it makes total sense. Um, there's a kind of interpretive side to it as well, I think, with, with particularly with the RSA talks, where the people standing on stage and giving these talks weren't envisaging what was going to be drawn. They weren't, they were just giving a talk. And actually, you know, it, it's, there's a kind of interplay there between um, not, not subverting what's being said, but also giving a slight different angle on it. You know, you can give it a different spin. You can, you can bring ideas out of what they're saying. You can reference things. Um, that they may not know are going to be in those final visuals. And I think there's, there's that wonderful, you know, it's almost like a kind of improvisation uh, quality to it, which I think also can you know, produce some really exciting results. I often um, hear that people say, you haven't drawn what I said, you've drawn what I meant. Wow, that must be incredible. Which is, you know, because it, that, that is the intersection of two different yeah. delivery mechanisms, isn't it? You know, you've got one channel, which is I deliver this as a speech and this is what I wrote. And sometimes it might it, it came out kind of how I wanted it to. And then, you know, when you put the apply the visual translation to that, you've got a whole new raft of ideas just yeah. butting up against that and then creating 
these different levels of understanding. Um, that's where it's really interesting, I think. Well, and it, and it plays exactly to everything that Dad talked about, you know, that we do process information differently and, you know, that we have to move away from this idea that we can only uh, understand things in one particular way, one particular medium, you know, in, in order for for it to resonate, for, for it to make sense to people, because that is exactly how our brains work. We're constantly digesting things differently. Um, so I would love to know, because you, you mentioned that the speakers might not know exactly what we're going to draw. Did they know? So when Dad did his talk, did he know it was going to be animated? No, I don't. And so this is... The, I don't think he did. The thing about it was, I think uh, in the early days, I think the RSA were kind of secretive about who they gave <laughs> our talents to. You know, they, they were like, oh. And they, so I would just get a piece of audio and go, right, they'd send the audio and then we'd send back a film. That was kind of how it went. And really, really trusting as a client to say, here's some stuff, do what you like with it. I think because it became an instant viral hit, they were like, this is successful mm. formula, don't break it. So that allowed us then to really approach this stuff as artists, you know, to go, what can I do with this stuff? What can I do with this medium? And it's grown from there. And, you know, people like Dan have come on board and he's taken and shaped how he processes, you know, how he processes, I'm sorry, I'm taking words from your mouth, but how I understand <laughs> you, you yeah. doing it, you know, you've, you've, you've brought your own version of, of that application to designing these things. Yeah, there's, and, there's um, an overlap, but it's, it's, not the, it's not the same. I think you, you, um, you kind of gravitate towards certain kind of modes of communication. And I think that that's, and you take that and you, it's, really, it's very hard to, even if you are trying to sort of imitate someone, or as you know, as said in the original um, uh, talk, that idea of, you know, in, in school, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's called copying. Uh, outside of school, it's called collaboration. You know, it's, right. it's you know, and there are elements in this film and in all of the work I've done over the, um, uh, you know, past ten years. Sometimes very consciously, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, referencing or reinterpreting ideas that uh, Andrew's done. Sometimes completely subconsciously, you will just realise you think this is a really great idea I've had here. Put it down on paper. I'm really pleased mm -hmm. with that. And then you'll watch something that Andrew made six months ago and go, it was in there all <laughs> along, and 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 he put it there. And that's you know that kind of um, you know, it's, it's creating a language and it's creating a, 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 a sort of toolbox uh, where we've, we've got a, there's a methodology that's it's not really written, but no. everyone has a, has a sort of slightly instinctual sense of what different modes of, you know, communicating we can put even in within a sort of, you know, uh, a relatively um, defined medium, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately what we're doing is unpacking information in space. So I look at it like you've got a, a suitcase stuffed full of ideas and you think, well, what have I got in this suitcase? You need to open it up and lay everything out on the bed and go, right, I've got some socks there, I've got a shirt there, hat there. Right, cool. Why am I packing a hat, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we do it. You then unpack it. Yeah. Then you can see the relationships between those elements. Then you can then repack them so that they make sense or cluster them or whatever. And then you can then apply lots of visual language over the top of that, whether it is something as simple as icons, glyphs, symbols, whatever, or very detailed, rich illustrations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those detailed, rich illustrations are just rich illustrations that are arrows to join up other content. But you've, you've illustrated them with like a row of people, for example. Um, but they're a chain that go back to early man and you want to show is you know early man to modern man but it's only a link between two concepts but you've illustrated that as a as a detailed illustration rather than just drawing an arrow from one thing to another. Yeah. so it's levels of granularity of detail and we're it's up to us how we decide to do that um and as i said before it's an organic process sometimes you'll do that Sometimes it'd be too detailed and you pair it back. Sometimes you um, amp up the detail. So um, it's a very, very rewarding process. But, and also, you know, as I said, with the RSA, very trusting and with yourselves as well, you know, and um, uh, getting the brief from your dad. Well, so this is, this is what I wanted to say, because I remember when the talk came out um, just the day before we first saw the RSA animate. 
um, we'd been at some event. Uh, my parents were involved in a charity and we'd been on a marketing day for them. And they had played an RSA animate at this event. And my mum, who was my dad's manager at the time, well, oh, throughout his entire life, um, got really passionate about this. And she was saying, why don't you have one? Why isn't there one done for your talks? <laughs> Um, she was furious about it. And literally the next day, they woke up to it being in their inbox. Wow. Um, because it, it, it really sticks my memory because it was just so cool that she was so angry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she was so blown away I by it. Overnight. I did it overnight, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Word got back. You've, you've made Terry Robinson angry. Um, but, in this, so, so in, but in this case, because we're here to talk about the new film, um, as, as you just mentioned, Dad did call you and asked you to do it. So can you talk a bit about you know, when he called and, and what that meant? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, um, it was great to get. We've been talk. We talked to Ken a couple of months before, or it might have even been longer. Um, and it was just on the back of we did a little little thing we wanted to do from uh, a book that he narr- one of the books he narrated as an audio book. And I, when I was listening to it, I was. He, it was about um, the the poem about going back to school. Yeah. And we animated that, you know, and then we had a conversation about you know working further together, and. Um, things happen, pandemics and things like that. And then I get, I get a call out of the blue from, from Ken and he's like, right, I've, I've got this thing. I want you to do it. And then obviously he dropped the bombshell about, you know, being sick. And it was yeah. just like, oh my God. I mean, I mean, it was, it was, it's gives me goosebumps even talking about it because he's like, I won't ever see this film, but I want you to do it. And it's, I mean, it's really humbling to be given that as a, as a project to do because you're like wow you're you're trusting me with something like this that obviously you're very passionate about and you never will get to see it and it it, it just it's really quite a thing to have it's quite a gift for us and so i really wanted to just put a lot of heart and soul into it and just make it make it something that i think he would be proud of oh he definitely would be I mean, and so he, I think I mentioned this to you before, but he called you the, either the day of or the day after he got his prognosis. It was almost, you know, rather than other doctors or anything, it was the, pretty much the first call that he made was to make this happen. So for it to be at this point where where it is and we're premiering it now is, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, he knew full well that the the talk that we, we then worked with, the call to unite, was... The very essence of the manifesto and imagine if um kate's book with her father that really inspired that piece and the extension of his work there um <clears throat> i remember that day i remember being told by ken that he'd done what he'd done um, that he called andrew yeah because he he just he just said catch <laughs> he threw a massive curveball and i didn't know necessarily what he was but he was so right he was so right to then trust you yeah. in particular and he was extremely proud of that talk but also he was so confident in your process and yeah what you would then deliver because he really wanted to give this to his audience didn't he, he it wasn't actually i don't think in his thought process really he would have thought too much about him not being able to see it but more so he was so um, happy with the call to unite and your involvement that meant that the world could see this and that was enough for him he must have been thinking about calling you beforehand and then when he found out when he got the yeah. prognosis thought well no time like the present you know and, and got on I, ma- I can you know knowing him i can imagine he'd been thinking about it that because he as you say he was so proud of the talk yeah um and when we sat down you know in that same that same two and a half week period when when he was passing away and talked about what the book would be what the manifesto would be um he said it's this talk you know this is the core of everything that i want to leave behind is this talk and so for people who maybe haven't seen it the call to unite was a talk that he did in may 2020 um it was organized by unite and it was a 24-hour live stream of a very cool people coming on to um kind of just rally everybody through the pandemic and it was in the first wave it was when we sort of thought maybe the pandemic wasn't going to last for too much longer um but it was so and and dad you know he knew he was sick at the time he didn't know how sick um but i think in the back of his head he sort of thought you know i might not get another chance to say these things and so he put everything into it um so can you because you've also you're now working not necessarily just because of the pandemic but you two are working remotely so could you talk a bit about the process of creating this because it's so incredible this is the first time 
today, I think that we've seen each other since we've been drawing this. Yes. All of this drawing has been done, you know, sort of um, over, over, yeah, um, uh, Zoom calls and other other forms of online communication, just to uh, really kind of piece this together. Well, it's also um, one of the first collaborations Dan and I have done as kind of you know let's let's just do this together rather than you know. Um, being directed for client films and whatnot, you know. Um, so this is a, a, a proper collaboration where all ideas have been brought to the table and, you know, we've got a, a, a trio of us doing it, so Dan, myself and Phil, who's the animator. And, you know, all of our ideas are being put in. There's a basic shape. I, I, knew, I knew I wanted to work with Dan on it because Dan's got a very, very great sense of structure with these things. Um, and can and can can put a shape to something that makes it easy for someone like me to then put some detail in, you know. Um, and I think at the beginning we had an idea of what it could look like, and then we've got some early drawings and of of rough shapes of what it could look like. Uh, and I, I kind of thought, well, three circles. I did actually have some stuff in my sketchbook I was doing. I was, you know, as I said before, you don't start with the end in mind. You just jump into stuff and then things just appear. So the early sketches had a rough idea, a rough shape of what this thing could look like. I sent those roughs to Dan. Dan then put a spin on it and said, oh, I could structure it in a bit more of a kind of formal way and started putting some more some sort of geometric shapes around it, like here's how we could structure this information. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very, uh, you know, again, going back to the point about that sort of, you know, not being able to approach it necessarily in a linear way. Um, it was something you listen to the talk, you read it through, and there's a, a, a really sort of coherent structure underneath that it does, you know, sort of dart around a little bit because you sort of have to do that. You can't just sort of tell a story chronologically always, um, but it's about kind of, um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to the past, we're looking to the future, we're in the present. Um, we've got these kind of big themes of, you know, sort of the, the, the divergence from the, you know, kind of natural ways of living um, and everything that sort of comes from that, you know, relating that to, uh, you know, to education, relating it to the climate crisis, to agriculture. Um, it, it sort of very quickly became apparent to me that there was, um, you know, there, there was a shape to this. Uh, there, was a, there was a shape and that shape uh, in, in the first instance was very, very simple um, uh, and just had a kind of flow, almost sort of, you know, here's the past, here's the present, you know, here's kind of society, here's uh, sort of nature and agriculture, here's where things sort of split and here's where we're trying to kind of converge those back together, really, through the, through the sort of ultimate vision and the call at the end. Um, and everything that's kind of developed on top, we've just kind of built on that and we've built a sort of world around it, essentially, where, you know, that... The, the essence of that, you know, sort of probably 10 minute scribble uh, is, is sort of like buried underneath it, but still sort of uh, holding some of it together. So, um, yeah, I think that as, as Andrew says, it's then just sort of you, you create that um, environment, that kind of world in which to work. And then that gives ideas and gives new uh, subtleties, new references, new, um, you know, whole new kind of things to explore that you have to find a way to fit them in. Uh, but it's just a really uh, exciting process, you know, even when it's kind of drawing, you know, I'm drawing buildings and I'm drawing sets. And then, you know, a few minutes later, just through the way in which we're working, uh, suddenly people start appearing on those sets. Andrew's wonderful characters just start populating just the, even just the little things I put in to fill a bit of space, like, uh, you know, over in the sort of terrace over here where we've got uh, back into the industrial revolution and the industrial town. Uh, it was just a, an awkward corner where I had to fill, and I was just, I'm going to put an outhouse there. It just, it takes up some space. It's, uh, you know, it gives a bit of uh, period detail, uh, but then can kind of, you know, obviously sparks things to then go, right, well, can, we, can, we, can we put a joke yeah, in Yeah, so, I mean, a... the creative uh, thing that I thought was, well, if you're going to put an outdoor loo in, someone's got to be using it, right? <laughs> Check off the toilet. toilet. Check off the toilet. It's check off the toilet. So the door's flying open, and there's a lady like shaking her finger, and there's a kid jumping, running away with the toilet paper. So you know, there's these little jokes where you think, put the humans in, 
I love working, you know, I love the human element in, in, in work, you know, people are attracted to humans, story, narratives. Um, although that, you know, we've structured this thing on this geometric shape and put buildings and sets and stuff on top of it, there's still very much in there of the humans, which mm. is what ultimately we're talking about at the end of it, you know, we're getting away from this mechanical system, going back to this sort of new new but old way of working more natural forms more circular forms rather than sort of straight line as ken says in the original thought the bells ringing and the factory lines and yeah. all that sort of stuff we really wanted to mirror that talk so sort of almost upgrade that talk not the talk itself but the 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 elements in that talk the factories the industrialization the kind of mechanized stuff we were very keen on just showing how humans impose their will and their structure through that part of, of history. Um, this very kind of straight line buildings, straight, you know, Game of Thrones things popping up. <laughs> and, um, and then we wanted to see if we could then, as a picture, soften those things and get back to this sort of natural order, this tree, this tree of knowledge at the end of the piece, where it's more networked, more less linear so more connected more brain like more thought like more human that's totally what we wanted to try and do with the aesthetic of it so um i think it's working i think it works yeah there's um, uh, a lot of you know i think it's 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 like wrestling with something really where there's a kind of constant push and pull to fit things together to make things work you know there's still i think a lot to do with this to even just um you know kind of create the, the sort of the planes of kind of perspective uh, you know make sure that the focus is always uh, where we want it to be as you know Phil comes in and you know animates these scenes obviously we can frame in we can come in close but even looking at you know what do we do with like the contrast and the um, you know the sort of uh, the levels of different scenes to be able to say right this is all background at this stage we might come back to that later but right now we need you to be looking at this um, and that really is just going to be that sort of, you know, it's the kind of presentation pass at the end where you just get it to, to, to all gel and all um, uh, come together into hopefully something that is, um, you know, stunning to look at, stunning. You just want to dive in, really. Yeah, but one of the things that it's still um, doing, I think, is um, what, what I like to do with, with work like this is layer stuff so that you often can put something in and then come back to it and then something's changed in that picture. You'll see it in the changing education paradigms, the thing that the thumb will rub something out and put something else in, you know, there'll be a change to that drawing. Essentially this is the same thing that happens here, is that you can do a camera pass over it and then come back to something and the, things would have changed or something would have evolved, or, you know. I, I love that sort of reuse of, of, of the uh, elements that we have created opening things up like a doll's house almost you've got a building there you've got another idea you want to put in later can we can we draw the inside of that building fade the facade down and um show inside and and yeah as you say just kind of create that kind of intricate uh layering that just builds and builds and is cumulative and i think that's always something that that kind of you know the rsa just the sort of big picture pulling out to see the whole thing at the end it's you know so you really get to see a story as a whole in one shot and if you started with that people would just be like yeah i mean often that's that's one of the things that um you know when we do construct these films you often send people like the finished image and it's like everything stacked in there and you say well this is the end point right when you start the film it builds so it's a, it's a very kinetic process of one thing builds on another um and the reveal at the end is is one of those points, and I, I, I'm I'm sure that um, it's also one of the things that was sort of arbitrary when we, we were doing these things initially was um, what we're going to do at the end. How are we going to finish these things? And then you do a scroll or you pan out or whatever, and, and then people go, oh, "It's all joined up. How has he done that? How have they done that? It's crazy." And then you think, "Oh my god! Well, that makes total sense because it." It joins up thinking, you know, people have followed the narrative through something like this. And at the end, it's like a reminder of here's what we, here's what you remember, what you remember. 
if the, you like. The Agatha Christie yeah. how to write a murder mystery, isn't it really? You have to start with the end and work backwards. Uh, you can't, you can't <laughs> start writing a murder mystery and, yeah. and not decide uh, who's, oh, who's yeah. the culprit. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Although, as you can see on this drawing, you know, we're still in the process of making this. <laughs> At the moment. Well, I I would say my experience on this side of catching said curveball and saying, if you need anything, just let me know. Otherwise, you guys go right <laughs> because the, you can see the collaboration yeah. between the two of you even now. And whilst this is the first time that you've been physically in the room together, being able to then marvel at the work that you've both produced is incredible. That it's it's so this cool. passing over of just this idea riffing and coming back and. It really is the epitome of the creative process that your dad talks about and you do in the book. Um, and for me, just being an observer with uh, Kate and I reviewing this, as you've been excitingly showing us during this process, I can honestly say that we, we've been we've been through the middle and this has morphed so much. Like Just to be able to then see this landscape in front, I know you have a, a bigger one in front of you there. Like It's remarkable. The work you have here, are there any particular highlights that you've got within this piece? Um, <laughs> it's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I, I really, really enjoyed the um, doing the kind of industrial revolution, well, from the agricultural revolution to the industrial rev revolution, just putting those characters in was great. And it's just about the research in what, the transition between i was like what does an what does agricultural revolution people look like obviously they are kind of based pretty much in the global north at that point where all of the resources and all of the industry and all of the 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 imperialist cultures were had all the resources at that point so yes you're going to be biased towards a certain um group of people so obviously the costumes come from Northern Europe and whatnot, you know, that's where the money was, that's where the framing of that narrative was at then. So you think, right, okay. And I was surprised to think, well, peasant clothing didn't change a lot from 15th century to 18th century, really. They were just farm workers and it kind of looks a bit the same. And then there was the, the Enlightenment where things started to go, oh, things are changing now, you know. Money, there's a, a lot more money in that system. And so... You, you adapt the clothing to sort of suit that. And it's just those little things where I, I was like getting a bit detailed or intended about, uh, orientated about, oh, what does that piece of clothing look like? What kind of hats would they, you know, I was getting like all that stuff you probably will never see, <laughs> but it's there. And I like that sort of thing. It's kind of a bit geeky. Um, and then the sort of transition up into the sort of late Victorian and then going into the sort of the school, the combine harvester school and all that sort of stuff. And then modern children, more obviously a lot more diversity as, you know, we get into the modern age and, and global communities network, you know, globalisation happens. Yeah. Um, the narratives have changed. So it's trying to represent all of that stuff going on at, at, at the same time. So for me, I like the research involved in in people and those characters and populating it with a sort of warm human story mm -hmm. there's some odd, there's some funny things going on in there um dan have you got any i mean you know i highlights for me it, I, i'm probably much more of a set builder than andrew i think it was actually i wanted to be a set designer when i was actually at school um the um the careers officer was completely stumped by that um set designer for a film <laughs> um in a sort of roundabout way, I feel like he eventually got there, especially, you know, and I love something like this where, uh, you know, we, we're looking at condensing time. You're looking at condensing this huge swathe of uh, so much things happening into, into a single image, which will, you know, obviously kind of build and layer. Um, and, you know, the, the, the sort of parts of my work, which are sort of the most resolved at the moment, the, you know, the sort of little town uh, on the hill in the foreground and that sort of, uh, you know, the sort of larger skyline in the background, you know, there's, when when you see this in animation i've actually gone through behind that viaduct before it appears there are fields behind that power station there's a there's a stream uh you know that's all gonna you're gonna see that change you're gonna see uh you know essentially kind of time compressed uh you know into a concept and it's it's that kind of detail again you know we put all of that work in 
and then kind of look back at the script and look back at it and you think you know you've had all of this richness to work with from the from the talk and then you realise that that's 30 seconds out of a, out of a sort of 10 <laughs> plus minute piece. And you think, was that really worth it? And then, of course it then was worth yes, it. you think, yes, actually it was. Because it, I'm going to I'm gonna know every single little layer I put in there to achieve and so, what will be hopefully an emotional um, yeah, impact for some of those moments. Yeah, so as, as well. Dan said, he, he's very much the kind of set builder on this, which I know I'm the kind of like actor that will put the characters in and whatnot. Um, and it's quite nice that we've had this sort of relationship between left and right of the image as well. You know, I've been mm. working on the kind of right hand side, the tree, the more natural forms, and Dan's been in the kind of like mechanical set build buildings and very technical aspect of stuff. However, uh, when we were talking, we were talking about um, I love all that bit as well. I love all that period of time where those those great transitions of, of society were happening. And you had those rubs between people that were like romantic, um, like William Blake. And Dan was mentioning something like William Blake there. And I was like, oh, well, what we should do is put William Blake in that landscape or an element of William Blake. And so I thought, well, an angel or something like that, one of Blake's angels. And then I, when Dan drew that train coming across the viaduct there, it reminded me of the, uh, the Turner painting. I think it's like Steam and Speed. I can't remember the exact title. I might have to get that right, but um, maybe we can do a caption with that one. Uh, <laughs> and and it just that in that painting, it was Turner's. Obviously, the transitional period of time was Turner was coming from a romantic period of time into this very very industrial period of time. And in the foreground of with the train coming across Turner's viaduct, you've got this hare running across the field. So I put the hair running across our field as well, in there. He's about there. Okay. It's, I, funnily enough, he's massive. If you had scaled that, if that was like a real hair, it'd be like a horse. Kind of 80s level hair. But we were talking, and uh, obviously because Bill, Dan and I were talking, but we'll get to this in a minute about how we actually physically work with, with the software and all of that stuff. So I was like, oh, Dan, um, the angel and the hair. And then Phil was like, oh, that sounds like a good name for a pub. <laughs> so we're like, let's put the angel and the hare as a pub in the town. So we've got this kind of little meta relationships that we're doing with each other. We're like talking to each other and putting little references to ourselves in stuff that no one will ever see. <laughs> well, they will now. Well, they will see now. They'll see it now and they'll look for it. Um, and then I was doing some stuff on the warehouse. Actually, I want to talk about that in a minute. Uh, the R. Kensington warehouseman. I was going to ask. Go and talk about that. Uh, and I said, oh, yeah, Phil, what about the uh, the hook and barrel? And he's like, that's another good name for a pub, isn't it? So we've got the, the angel in the hair and the hook and barrel. And I said, well, the hook and barrel is where the kind of labourers go. You know, that's the warehouse pub, isn't it? Whereas the angel in the hair is where the poets and the painters go. So we've got this class structure of pubs, fictitious <laughs> pubs within the flower We've drawn either of them, yeah. We've I haven't got, got them drawn the pubs. <laughs> still got that to do. <laughs> Um, but that's one of the dangers, I think, but, with this working relationship is when you just, there's that constant like egging on, almost yeah. like, oh, we could do this, or we could do yeah. that, we could do this, we could do that. And then you sort of have to take a step back for a minute and go, we may we, do we some of these things, film. but you have to kind of sometimes, yeah, work out, um, not to say the pubs aren't going to go in there. Actually, I think the pubs um, have to go in there. Now we've talked about it. Well, they have oh, to they now. Have, they have to now. Yeah. But the thing about... I'll hold you to account. The thing about that, I think it, it just underlines that creativity element your dad talked yeah. about, which is... You know, you don't know at the beginning how creative this thing can be and let, until you get involved and then you rub up against other people, other ideas, um, time. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's just it's such a beautiful process to go through. It's a, a sentence that Dad wrote in the book in Imagine If. He wrote that creativity is call and response. Yeah. Uh, one idea can spark a... The, yeah, I'm butchering it, but one idea can spark a million more in the minds of others, the magnitude more in the minds of others, is what he said. And it's exactly, it's fascinating watching you two talk about it because you really see that call and response, um, you know, that collaboration side of it. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I, I know you are super geeking out over the way, like the, the digital platforms in which it was done. And <laughs> Andrew, you just mentioned that you talk about it. So will you, how, like, how did you actually, how are you actually making it? Well, it was all Dan's idea, really, um, about how to, to obviously working across time and space. I live down in Cornwall, Dan lives up here in Folkestone. And um, 
how do we how do we make such a these are big photoshop files you know they're massive uh, the, how uh, you need big computers to sort of move this information about and a file like this on its own is not going to uh, be friendly to that so the Dan devised a, a, a process of, of, of doing that. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so uh, from a technical perspective, uh, you can get lost in the amount of layers that are in, in a piece like this, you know, both creatively and technically. Uh, and it can, it can grind things to a halt whereby, you know, both the, 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 the computer you're working on, but your brain itself just starts to just say, I, I, cannot, I cannot process this anymore. Um, and you know, I think that one of the biggest obstacles to creativity and i think this you know really looks at um relates to the uh, education systems which don't encourage that is that the sort of rigidity and the, the 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 hurdles in the way can break that flow can take you out of a um a place where the best work is going to happen so for something like this once it was all designed in terms of one big layout we sort of worked out the you know the rough blocking of where things go uh the the sort of perspective the uh, the composition and the depth of the piece is then split it up into essentially kind of geographic zones which are named very sort of arbitrary and qualitative things like bottom left hill, far <laughs> background, uh, right tree, things like that and, and actually sort of separate it out into individual um, uh, you know sort of documents to work into uh, but those are linked through um, a series of smart objects in, in Photoshop so that we both have a, a kind of a central hub of the of the piece as a whole, uh, which has got a, not many layers in it. It's really just sort of scenes as a whole kind of coming together and slotting together. Um, and that's mirrored across my machine and Andrew's machine, all sort of synced up through, a, a okay. you know, online, uh, you know, storage and um, collaboration kind of platform. Uh, and it means that, you know, as long as we keep track of who's working on what scene, I can be like, right, today I'm going to be working on that background over there. So don't go in and start working over the top and saving over things. You know, so Andrew will be off on one scene, I'll be on another. Um, as soon as I save at my end, that will then, uh, you know, sync back uh, to the cloud, sync back over to Andrew's machine. If he's got the big hub, you know, image open, uh, it will then automatically update. So things will start to appear. Uh, and we're both working like that at either end so that, you know, sort of throughout the course of the day, um, you'll be keeping track of your own work, but actually seeing other things appear. And again, it's the, sometimes that's sort of surprising. I don't know what, what Andrew's going to be drawing at any point or <laughs> vice versa. You sort of see the, the work in progress and you see things sort of go in and then shift. And then I think, oh, that's a bit, that bit's looking great. And then you'll change it and it will look totally different 20 minutes later and still look great. Um, and I think that that sort of, it's it, it's a workflow I've been wanting to try out for a while. Um, I sort of worked on a project by myself in a similar way, but never done it, you know, sort of synced across two machines and across two ends of the country, really. Um, and it's been a really fun way of working because you're, you're not always stepping on each other's toes. You're not having to sort of manage these huge, huge files. Um, but at the same time, you are able to sort of track the the overall picture you're able to see the piece as a whole slowly kind of coming to place the slow forming you know and it goes back to that call and response thing that as dan said you know things will pop up every now and again you're like, oh you've done the building in the background oh, you put something in there you know or you, you do that sort of thing um so it and it, it's also coalescing towards the the, the grand finale you know yeah. it's uh, ultimately it's in service of of the, the tool you know we might have be noodling away doing this stuff, but the bottom line is, does it, does it do the job? Yeah. Does it promote what your dad was wanting to talk about? And um, I'm proud of it. I think it does. I think, um, I think it's, a, uh, it's a really important message, you know, and it's one of those things that it's obvious once you hear it, you know, that we should be looking after this and this together in order to create harmony you know and it's very much a a clarion call to, to that i think yeah. and um i hope hopefully people will get as much out of this one as because it is ultimately a very much a companion piece to the first one it's almost like an up it's i said upgrade but it's not an upgrade it's like a 
a reimagining of certain concepts from that first piece. But then just obviously your dad's ideas were built upon from that point of view as well. So it's just, it's sort of grown with his ideas, hopefully. So it's, it is that call and response thing again. Well, you're freaking out, aren't you, at the whole, con- at the whole process? Oh, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> well, we are, we are about to play it. So I just want to say to both Andrew and Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about it. Um, we're really excited for the world to see it. And honestly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for making his vision come true. And, you know, I wish more than anything he were here to see this. Um, but I'm just so grateful that you've done it. It really is. He, he would be so delighted, wouldn't he? He'd be so delighted and so proud. Um, well, it's an absolute yeah. pleasure. I mean, from, yeah, from our really point is. of view, it's a delight to work with this. And, you know, um, just really happy that it's it's born into the world. <laughs> well, without further ado, let's play it. <laughs> 